الحمد لله الحمد لله نستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مذل له ومن يذلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسول أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد أيضا وقضى ربك ألا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في الحديث الخلق عيال الله فأحب الخلق إلى الله من أحسن إلى عياله أو كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم My dear respected brothers, sisters and youngsters The topic tonight inshallah is about parenting And this topic as we all know it is a very important topic, especially in the time that we live in and for all times to come. Because parenting is one of the oldest profession for which few people have mastered. And why do I say it is the oldest profession? Because from the time of Hazrat Adam alayhi salam, this responsibility, this task of being a parent was given. And this will continue until the day of Yawm al And just as how in every profession, a person, he looks forward to making sure that he has the requirements, he has the qualifications for that profession or for that career. Similarly, being a parent, we have to ensure that we have the correct qualifications, we have the correct recommendations, we have the correct tools to be a parent. Many people think that being a parent, it starts only when we have a child. But that's a wrong ideology and a wrong notion and a wrong understanding. Being a parent and having that responsibility of being a parent, it starts from the time we intend to get married. Who is our spouse? Because these are the people who will be the partners who have to raise that child. And as we all know, as I mentioned, that few people have mastered it very few people have mastered parenting because of the fact that many of us we learn from others there is no book that we can go and pick up and say I will learn parenting because by the time you finish studying that book everything that you would have studied would change because from generation to generation the children are different so the techniques that your grandparents would have used your parents would not have used it the techniques that you would use, your children may not be able to use it. However, Islam has given us some basic guidelines as with regards to how we should carry out this responsibility of being a parent. And Rasulullah has demonstrated to us how it is that we can be the best of parents. So this tells us from what I have said, that this responsibility of being a parent, it is something that one, it is challenging. Two, it is a responsibility that is ongoing. Because always remember, no two children are the same. So sometimes you may do, or you may try certain techniques with one child and you may be successful. Try that same technique with, with another child and you will not be successful. So therefore, we have to look at what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given to us, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. And inshallah, by fa following these guidelines, inshallah, Insha'Allah, we will be able to become good parents, insha'Allah. But before I go into the techniques or some of the guidelines that we can use in order to be good parents, first of all, what is the reward of being a parent? What rewards do we get? You know, sometimes we look at parenting as a burden. We only think that I am only giving, I'm not receiving. I am the one who is working so hard to provide for the family. I am the mother is doing so much to provide for the family. The father is doing so much to provide for the family. To be a parent, there's so much of sacrifice. And really and truly, sometimes even as children, when our parents tell us 
that you know I'm sacrificing so much for you we don't even understand until we become real parents then we really understand what it is like to sacrifice so sometimes as parents we ask what is there what is it there for me that I gain what benefit is there for me all I'm doing is giving I'm giving I'm not receiving but Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam has first of all elevated us to the highest of status and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in the holy Quran وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا وَإِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And your Lord has decreed that you worship none except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That your Lord has decreed that you worship none except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And immediately after that instruction comes وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And showing kindness to parents. Showing kindness to parents. It shows the status in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has elevated parents. That Allah, after mentioning that there is no one to be worshipped except Him, He didn't mention wa iqam is salah, He didn't mention zakah, He says, wa bil walidayni ihsana, and kindness to parents. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He mentioned in a hadith, He says, Ridha rabbi, Ridha al walidi. That the pleasure of your parents is in the pleasure of Allah. When your parents become pleased with you, Allah becomes pleased with you. When your parents become displeased with you, Allah will become displeased with you. Look at another lofty status that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as parents. Not only that, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, he says a person whomsoever he gives his child knowledge of deen he gives him that understanding of Quran on that day of Yawmul Qiyamah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause him to wear a crown a crown which is so radiant it outshuns the sun it is so radiant that if it, it is brighter than the sun subhanallah that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated us as spirits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so many rewards, my dear respective brothers and sisters and youngsters. It is even mentioned that a person, and this is the responsibility of a parent, it is even mentioned that a person who he raises a child, he teach them Islam, he teach them adab, he teach them etiquette, he provides for them, and then he gets that person, that child, that child marry, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that person to enter Jannah through ever which door he wishes, subhanAllah. Because this in reality is not an easy task. And here it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is helping us to gain Jannah very easily, subhanAllah. Not only that, but then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, he says, when a man dies, when a man dies, he says, every single thing is cut off from him except in three things. Except in three things. He says, the first one is ilmun nafi'ah, beneficial knowledge. Beneficial knowledge. Not only that, but that of what is known as sadaqatun jariyah, perpetual charity. And the third thing is waladus salih, a pious child, who will make dua for his parents. Now my dear respective brothers, imagine after you die, sometimes a person may not have wealth, a person may not be able to acquire knowledge that he may be able to teach others. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed many of us with children. So the Prophet is telling us that if it is that we have a pious child who makes dua for us, that dua will continue to reach us even in our graves, subhanAllah. So these are just a few of the rewards of being a parent. This is just a few of the rewards. But as I mentioned, in order to be a good parent, there are a few guidelines. A few guidelines which Islam has laid down. And after doing a little research, I, have come, I, I came up with what is known as an acronym for which it shows that if it is as parents we lead with these qualities, inshallah, we will be able to fulfill that responsibility of being a parent. We will be the parent or the ideal parent insha'Allah and the first and that that word that I use lead I use each letter to represent those qualities 
So the first thing from that, um, the acronym that I use is L, which means love. As parents, we have to demonstrate that quality of love. Second, education. Both religious and that of this world, the sciences of this world. Or what is known as Dini education and um, Dunyawi education. A. Authority. As parents, we must be able to lead by establishing our authority. And D. Discipline. So these are the four qualities, inshallah, I have explained. I will explain, inshallah. And then I also use that same acronym of LEAD and I turn it around and I say we have to deal with our children using these same four letters. The first D, dialogue. We must be able to deal with our children by having dialogue with them. E, we must be able to empower our children, build their character, build who they are. A, we must be affectionate. And L, we must be lenient. The first few years, it is the responsibility especially not just of the mother but also of the father but at that time it is more the mother who has to play that role and what do she teach that child the prophet ﷺ, he told us he says the first thing that should be taught to that child when they start to speak is that of la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah look at the time when the child is born what do what is the first thing we say we say the adhan in the right ear and the ikoma in the left ear the reason for that is that the first thing you want to instill into that child is the tawheed, recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the first thing you want to establish. So when it is that as a, as a parent, the first education, the first thing is to teach that child Islam. Teach that child Quran. Teach that child about Islam, adabs, etiquette, mannerism. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in a hadith, he says, Al-ilmu fi fi saghri. That knowledge that is taught fi saghri, while a child is young, qanashqi fi hajari is as though something has been engraved on a stone. So it shows that whatever that child learns while he is small, it remains with that child. It resides with that child even when he becomes a big man. So at that time, in those few years from at least from infancy right up until approximately 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, 13 years, we have to keep teaching our children Islam. But those first years of early childhood, it is the years that is most important. The Prophet ﷺ in a hadith has shown us the various levels of authority. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned, he says, Ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolan That indeed, without a doubt, each and every one of you, you're a shepherd. You're in charge. You have a responsibility. Wa kullukum mas'oolan an ra'iyyatihi And you will be questioned about your responsibility. So each and every one of us, we have responsibilities. And each and every one of us, we will be questioned about that responsibility. Being a parent, Allah has given you that authority. Allah has given you that honor and he has given you that authority. And with that authority comes accountability. Always remember, any authority that is given to you comes at accountability. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, فَالْحَاكِمْ وَالَّذِي عَلَى النَّاسِ رَائِنْ وَهُوَ مَسْؤُولٌ أَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ a hakim, a leader, or a ruler. He is that one who is in charge of the people. He is that one who is responsible for the people. Ra'in, and he's a shepherd, he's responsible. Wahua mas'ulan an ra'iyatihi, and he will be questioned about his responsibility. So, above all of us is our leaders. They will be responsible. For the people, the masses. The Imam is responsible for his Jamaat. The Amir is responsible for his Jamaat. The Amir or the leader or the Hakim is responsible for his community. 
and they will be questioned about that responsibility. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he broke it down. Now we are going to the home now. He says, وَالرَّجُلُ رَاعٍ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ And a man is that one who is the ra'in. He's the authority of his home. He's responsible for his home. وَهُوَ مَسْؤُولًا عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ And he will be questioned about that responsibility. So the fact that we are the fathers in the home, we are the Amir, we are the Amir of the home. That is the status which Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given to us. That is a responsibility which Allah and His Rasul has given to us. So the father is the head. Then Al Maratu, the woman or the wife. Ra'iyatun. She's the Ra'iyah. She's the one who is the vice Amir. She's in charge in the absence of the father. She's also responsible. Ala bayti zawjiha wa waladi. Subhanallah. She don't only have one responsibility. She has two. Ala bayti zawjiha. She's responsible upon the house of her husband. So in his absence, she's responsible for the house. The wealth of the house. Everything that is within the house, she's responsible. وَوَلَدِهِ and the children Subhanallah So she is responsible for the home and for the children وَهِيَ مَسْؤُولًا وَهِيَ مَسْؤُولَةٌ عَنْهُمْ And she will be questioned anhum about them So it shows the chain of authority If it is that we have a We belong to a jamaat or whatever the case may be The hakim, the leader, the amir, the imam He is in charge of the community He is responsible for the community And he will be questioned about that now coming to the home. In the home, the father is the Amir. If it is in the absence of the father, the mother, she's the Amira. She's the one who's responsible for the home. So it shows that this is the authority that has been given. But sometimes this authority that is given to us, we deprive, or you wouldn't say deprive, but sometimes we undermine the authority of each other as parents. So for example, let me just give you an, ex an, an example how sometimes we undermine the authority of the parent. The first thing, sometimes if the mother is correcting the child, we try to correct the mother while she's correcting the child. This creates problem in disciplining the child. In establishing authority because what you're saying is that really and truly you have no right to correct that child if it is as the father you's not you're not pleased then what you should do in privacy you should tell the parent listen this is not the way to do it. this is how you should do it. because the moment that you correct the mother in front of the children what it has done it has taken away that authority from the mother it has taken away the authority from the mother and what happens in your absence so when you're home the home is well no problems and all of a sudden you're out of the house because remember that most of the time the father would spend out of the house trying trying to earn a living when you're out of the house now the one who's supposed to be in charge now is there which is the mother what happens she's speaking to the children and the children are not listening to her because you have undermined her authority in doing that now, what the mother will say? When your father come, I will tell him. This is a wrong approach. Because the child now, the mother now, is reducing that authority that she has. And what is she saying? That when the father come, he will deal with it. So now it shows that the mother has no authority. So when it is that the mother alone is home, the children reap havoc. They are not listening to the mother. No obedience. And the mother, she's left there frustrated and helpless. And then when the father comes home now, and he has to discipline, he is tired, he has to deal with it, he becomes frustrated. So there's no discipline that takes place. So how it should be done? It is that the authority of the father is there. The authority of the mother is there. The mother should not do things that will undermine the authority of the father. As telling the child, don't worry with your father. Don't listen to him. Or vice versa. The father should not tell the, the children, don't listen to your mother. Because by doing this, you're undermining the authority of both these individuals.
which is a very integral part in the upbringing of a child. The other thing about authority that is very, very important. When it is that we are establishing authority, we should establish authority and be firm in our authority. What do I mean by this? Sometimes the parent or the father, he gives an instruction. And the child will come and say, oh dad, please, or oh mom, please. And that authority or that instruction that we would have established is removed. Just by the begging of the child. Or the child come and give you a hug. Or the child give you a kiss. Or the child do some favor that you like. Or the child does something, some, he prepares some food that you like. And with that you say, okay, okay, okay. The child is working reverse psychology on you. You have to be able as parents. If you give an instruction, follow through with it. Follow through with your instructions. Because the time that you do not follow through with your instruction, you have compromised your authority as a parent. Because once the child finds that, listen, I did something wrong, dad say he will do so and so and so. But all I have to go and do is wash that car and that's the end of it. Dad, ain't forg dad forgive me. Or go and give dad a hug or give mom a hug and that's the end of it. Then you have compromised your authority as the father. So follow through with your authority. Secondly, when you are giving an authority, you give such an authority with the fear of Allah, subhanAllah. Sometimes you say things to children and you don't realize that Allah will take you to task for that responsibility. That is why the Prophet ﷺ, he says, he says, You will be questioned about your responsibility. So don't feel that you will do your children, you will be unjust to them and Allah will not question you about that. Allah will question you about that. So while reprimanding your children, while it is that a person is disciplining their children, establishing authority, you should not be a tyrant. If it is that you have two or three or four or five children, you should be just when you're giving a punishment. So if it is that, let's say for example, they did something wrong and you said, okay, your punishment for all of you is like this. But then you pull one aside and you say, you know, you are my favorite. Don't worry, you don't have to do it. Then you are unjust. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question you about that. As simple as it is. So when you're establishing your authority, establish it with the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're punishing them, punish them with the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last quality. <coughs> D. Discipline. What do we consider to be discipline? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He told us in a hadith He says Muru awladakum bis salah wa hum abana'u سَبْعِي سِنِينَ وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ أَبَنَاءُ عَشْرِ سِنِينَ وَفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَهُمْ فِي الْمَدَاجِعِ The Prophet ﷺ, he gave us a hadith. And in this hadith, discipline is established. He says, Muru, command, instruct, Awladakum, your children, bis salah, with salah, with prayer. You may ask, how, is, how commanding your children with salah is discipline? My dear respective brothers, my dear respective sisters and youngsters, if we can be disciplined with our salah, our entire life will be disciplined. Because salah is about being disciplined. Salah teaches us time and it teaches us place. 
It teaches us at this particular time, you have to do at this particular action, you have to behave in this particular way. At this particular time, you must be at this particular place, you must do this particular thing. This is what Salah teaches us. So immediately, when a person hears the call for Adhan, without anybody telling you anything, what is the action? Everybody stands up, line up. Thousands of people. Look at what happens in the Haram, both Makkah and in Medina. When the Adhan is called, Ikama is called, everybody finds themselves in a line. Nobody has to go and tell them, you line up there, you line up there. Everybody know what they have to do. When the Imam stands and the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, everybody go in the posture. So Salah brings about a particular type of discipline. If it is that it's time for Fajr, people know they have to get up the Fajr and do a thing at a particular time, they do it. So Salah teaches us discipline as human beings, as individuals, as adults. So the Prophet is teaching us a little secret. He's teaching us, Muru awladakum, command your children, bis salah, with salah. Wahum abana sab'i sinin at the time when they're seven years. It means that at that time when they're seven years of age, instruct them with salah. Because what happens is that sometimes we will find that when we are going to perform salah, our children will be playing. And as parents, we don't even have the time to tell them, let's perform salah. In reality, what you're teaching them is discipline. There's a time and there's a place for everything. There's a time to play and there's a time to pray. Now is the time to pray. This is what you have to do at this time. This is where you have to be. So you're teaching a child discipline. Not only that. But you teach that child, if it is that you bring them to the masjid, how they should behave. Sometimes when we bring our children to the masjid, they don't know about discipline. They don't know how to behave. They don't know to separate the play field from the masjid. So when they come to the masjid, it is as though it is a play field. Because you have not taught them that responsibility of being disciplined. So at what age did the Prophet ﷺ teach us, told us that we have to start to enforce it? You don't wait until seven to enforce it. But by you doing it, they will observe you. By you enforcing it, they will observe you. So he says, Muru awladakum bis salah wa hum abana sab'i sinin. Encourage your children to perform salah at the age of seven because in reality what you're teaching them is discipline. Wadribuhum and strike them. So many people will have a problem with this. But it is the Prophet ﷺ is explaining and crack them some lashes. But the ulama, Sheikh Ibn al he mentions, he says that hitting them should not be in such a state where you create marks on their bodies. It should not be more than three lashes. It should not be done in such a way of violence. So you're not allowed to even hit a child in the face. You know, slapping them and all of these things. Or picking up a stick and hitting them. So the thing about it is that you can crack them, give them a few lashes. Explaining to them the importance of performing that salah. Hazrat Luqman radiallahu ta'ala an, he commanded his, his son, he says, do not ever give up salah. Be steadfast upon salah. Believe in Allah, believe in Tawheed and stay firmly upon salah. Because this is the training for our children. And in that, what you're teaching children is that there are consequences for your action. If you don't do this, then these are the consequences that follows. This is a means of teaching the child. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says, وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا And strike them, give them some lashes. وَهُمْ أَبَنَا إِشْرِينَ sinin If they reach the age of 10. So you give them three years to get themselves in order. Because in reality what you're doing now is that you're teaching them that this salah at the age of 10 you're about to approach becoming baling, reaching the age of puberty. So now it is a responsibility and it is a serious responsibility. So you're teaching a child to be disciplined. بَيْنَهُمْ And separate their beds. Subhanallah. Fil Separate them from their beds. Because at this age, a child becomes more conscious 
of sexual activities of the private parts of others. So do not keep them on the same beds. Despite the fact they are brothers and sisters, separate their beds because you are safeguarding them from fitna. So this is also a form of training. This is a form of discipline our children. We should never be afraid of disciplining our children. If we do not discipline our children, they will become a form of embarrassment for us. The Prophet, it is mentioned that manners make it man. Manners, mannerism, etiquettes, discipline is what will make you to become a good individual. And if these qualities of discipline, etiquettes, adab, it is instilled from a very young age, as I mentioned, it will remain with that child even in their old age. So this would have completed the acronym of LEAD. L for love, E for education, A for authority, and D for discipline. This next set of qualities, to deal what are the qualities that we need as parents to deal with our children? The first is that of dialogue. Speaking to our children. Different ages will require different conversations. As parents, we have to speak to our children. Mothers, speak to your daughters. Fathers, speak to your children, to your sons. And not just the mothers speak to the daughters and the fathers speak to the sons, but sometimes the mothers have to speak to the, the sons also. But at different ages, there will be different requirements. So sometimes at a young age, the mother, the child goes to school, the mother will ask the child a simple question. How was your day in school? Who are your friends? This should also be a conversation with the father also, that he should have dialogue with their, his children. Speak to them. They should, be, they should feel open that if they, a problem is affecting them, that they come and they speak with you. They must be dialogue. But the biggest problem we have is when our children reaches the age of adolescence, because they never had that open door policy with us. They never have that habit of conversing with us. They never had that habit of dialoguing with us. What happens is when they become adolescent, when they become teenagers, they do not dialogue with us. They hide things from us. And we do not know what is going on in the lives of our children. We do not have an, a clue as to what is going on with the, in the lives of our children. Their friends know everything about them. We do not know because we have closed that door of dialogue. So sometimes you're driving down the road with your son or your daughter. How was your day? How are things going? Why are you so sad? Why do you look so? And create that dialogue with them. Do not shut them down. Sometimes our children at a young age, from the time they reach home, from the time you reach home or the time you reach home or you reach them in school, they're so excited to tell mom and dad what happened today in school. Or what happened at home today and because you're so tired you shut them down that is closing the doors of dialogue do not ever close that door of dialogue no matter how tired you may be listen to them it may go through one ears and come through the other ears still give them the hear the hearing lend them your ears because the minute you chase them you don't see a tired you don't see a now come home from work what will happen they don't have a dialogue with you they will dialogue with someone else and you have shut that door of dialogue. And especially our teenage children, we have to be able to dialogue with them, speak to them. And they must feel confident enough that they can speak with you concerning anything whatsoever. They must not feel shy to speak anything with you. Discussion, whatever it is. So the first D is dialogue. E, empower. Empower. We have to empower our children. Many a times, we do what is character assassination. We destroy the character of our children even before they can build a character. We destroy their courage. We destroy their ego, ego 
we destroy their dreams even before they can even dream sometimes our children they come and they say dad mom you know i want to be this i want to be that i want to achieve this i want to achieve that and you will tell the child that impossible how you can get we don't have money for that the child may say well i want to become a scientist i want to become a doctor you might be a farmer your whole generation were farmers you never went to school and your son come in and tell you you know dad i want to be a doctor that is his dream and then you will tell him no you how you what will happen to the family business you, you when you finish school you will come in the farm we don't have money to, for you to go and study medicine you have destroyed that child's dream you should build on your children's dream empower them sometimes a child they will make something they will do something and sometimes it is not to our perfection it is not for what it is not in, a, in to, according to our level the child said dad look at what i made look at this thing and even before you say well wow that is so beautiful you say what kind of stupidness you made you have destroyed that child's vision but you should encourage them because as small as it may be he will try and he will try and he will try and he may perfect it sometimes we tell a child you can become nothing in life you have destroyed that child and sometimes you may not say it once or you may not say it twice but you say that become your phrase every time you become angry this is what you say you will not be anything in life now remember you are the parent and your dua for your children is accepted so when you are making such a dua for your children what do you expect to get so you have already destroyed the future of your child by the dua you are making you will become nothing in life so as parents be careful of what we say be careful of destroying our children's dream be careful of destroying what they make sometimes it happens that we we tell a child that maybe we have three or four children and sometimes two of our children they came out we are doctors father and mother's doctors and lawyers and the whole family are the educated ones the degree the, the career people but the last child he has no 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 love for that all he likes to do is he likes to fabricate he likes to build and what do you do you don't know nothing you're a dunce head and now you put down that child build on that child's dream no two children are the same he may incline to something else he may not follow the family's tradition do not discourage your children so empower them give them build their courage build their enthusiasm build their zeal build upon it if a child say i want to do this you encourage them you be a part of encouraging that child you be a part of that a affection how do we demonstrate affection the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in demonstrating this affection it is mentioned that hasan and hussein who was his most beloved grandchildren when he would perform salah they will come and they will sit on his lap and he will hug them and this is how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will demonstrate affection similarly we should also demonstrate affection with our children as parents simple hugs from a young age we hug our children and no matter how old they get sometimes it happens that once they reach teenage adolescence that hugging stops so when they start preschool you will get a hug and a kiss and from the time they reach first year second year standard 1 that hugging stops you don't get the hug anymore 
When they reach university, no more hugs, no more kiss. That's it. No, it is important for you to still hug them. Even if it is not on a regular basis, basis, ever so often, give them a hug. Because that hug shows your affection for them, that you still love them. A simple thing like your children, you come and you rub their hands on their heads. It shows a form of affection. The Prophet ﷺ, he would show affection by rubbing his hands on children's head. Just by rubbing them, that little affection. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he said there is no goodness. There is absolutely no goodness in that person who is not shown affection and who affection is not shown to him, subhanAllah. There is no goodness in that person who is not shown affection and who is affection is not shown to him, subhanAllah. So if you don't know what is affection, if you don't know what is love, if you don't know a touch, sometimes we will see that sometimes teenagers, you hug them and they feel funny because they are not accustomed to that hug and that affection. When last have we hugged our children? When last have we hugged our children and say, I love you? When last have we hugged our daughters? When last have we hugged our sons? No matter how big they get, still hug them, show them that affection. <coughs> the last quality. L. Leniency. In exercising this quality of leniency, our children will make mistakes. They are human. We make mistakes. And if it is that every time we make mistakes, someone has to buff us up and get down on our truth, then what, how would we be feel? How would we feel? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran in Surah Taghabun, verse 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He just reminds us. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa in ta'fu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru fa inna Allah ghafur rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says Wa in ta'fu And if you forgive Wa tasfahu And you overlook Wa taghfiru And you pardon Fa inna Allah ghafur rahim Verily Allah is that one who is more forgiving, most merciful if it is that you, you forgive, you overlook, and you pardon, then verily Allah is most forgiven, most merciful. Don't we want that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show mercy to us? How much mistakes do we make in life? But no one there to buff us up and give us a scolding. Similarly with our children, they will make mistakes. And yes, I'm not saying that we cannot reprimand them. I'm not saying that we cannot admonish them. But we must be able to be lenient. And even in our reprimanding, there must be some leniency. And I will give you an example. <coughs> Once in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, some dates were sent to the Prophet ﷺ. So these dates, it was charity now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are not allowed they are prohibited from from taking that of charity like zakah so they cannot receive zakah so hassan who was a small child very small didn't even know what the dates were sent for he started to pick dates and eat and he put it in his mouth and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw him took the dates and put it in his mouth and started to chew the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says kha kha saying it in a form of admonition in the sense that don't you know that you're not supposed to eat that spit it out he didn't hit him as a matter of fact it is mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam never hit anyone he never hit his children he never hit his wife nor did he ever hit his slaves so even in that reprimanded, he says, ha, ha, meaning that don't do that, stop it. Now, in this, he was correcting him, but how did he correct him? He correct him with leniency. He didn't grab him, squeeze his mouth, and say, spit it out, 
Don't you know that Banu Hashim not supposed to eat from the dates of charity? He didn't do that. In a nice way. So similarly, when we are admonishing our children, when we are reprimanding them, there must be some leniency. Just as how we know that a person, so we must know, for example, a simple remedy we can use is we give the three strikes. And this is something I also admonish. I, I use three strikes and you're out. On the third strike, no. So in the first case, I may tell you to do something. And children, sometimes you tell them, move that thing from there. You make a spin and you come back, it didn't even move because they're so busy playing. It remains there. You come back the second time, you still see it. You say, listen, the sec next time I come back and I find this thing here, I will deal with you. Huh? And sometimes just by that stern warning, it is enough for them to move it. If it is at the third time, if at the third occasion, they did not move it, then you enforce what you promise, which you will deal with it. Dealing with it necessarily don't have to be beating. Dealing with it could mean that you see that one I told you to pick up, now you have to pick up all, you have to clean all. Or you have to clean the entire room. But with leniency. Sometimes they may start it, and then you realize they're going, and you also go and help them. So there's leniency. So in dealing with our children, in reprimanding them, there should be some leniency. In correcting them, there should be some leniency. So just so that we can have a fair understanding of the qualities that we need as parents to deal with our children. D, dialogue. E, enforce. Sorry, empower. A, affection. And L, leniency. So my dear respective brothers and my dear respective sisters and youngsters, as I explained before, parenting is something, it is a responsibility, it is a task, for which we cannot perfect it because generation keeps changing but we can follow certain guidelines that inshallah once we continue to follow these guidelines inshallah we will become the best of parents secondly is that it is a tireless it is a job that our children can never repay us only allah will repay us with that that responsibility of being a parent and what is that reward inshallah it is that of jannah it is that of knowing that while you're in the grave, your children that you would have made, that you would have spent that time and energy upon, that inshallah they can make dua for you. But in, in achieving this, as parents, we have to lead with certain qualities. And what are those qualities? L, which is love. We have to establish love within our family. We have to demonstrate love to our children. We have to demonstrate love to our spouses. The next quality is that of E. We have to educate our children. We have to teach our children. Teach our children knowledge of deen and knowledge of the dunya. We have to teach them etiquette, adab. A is that of authority. We must be able to establish authority in the home. We must lead with authority. Our children must see us as the authority in the home. The children should not assume the role of the authority and we are the children in the home. No, it should never be like that. And D is that of discipline. We must discipline our children. And the method that we can use and we can start with is that of salah. Making our children punctual with salah so that they will understand that there is a time and there is a place for everything. And lastly, we should deal with our children with these qualities. D, dialogue. Speak with our children. Converse with our children. Find out, find out what is going on with our children. E, empowerment. We empower them. Let them feel as though they also have a say. Listen to them. Accept their ideas. A. Affection. Deal with them with affection. Show them love. If you do not show them love, then someone else will show them love on the outside. And L is that of leniency. Yes, they will make errors. They will make mistakes. They are prone to mistakes. They are inquisitive. But at the same time, well, while reprimanding them, while correcting them, we deal with them with leniency. And as the Prophet, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Holy Quran, Ku anfusikum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourself and your family from the fire. And that is our responsibility. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us the tawfiq and the understanding where it is that we will continue to make effort on our children. And one important thing that I forgot to mention 
that can solve all of this is dua. Never forget to make dua for our children. Constantly, every day, our duas should be for our children. Make dua for our children. So I hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us as parents. May He make it easy to fulfill this responsibility of parents as, as a parent, inshallah.